Gary Talk, Gary Talk, listen to this Gary Talk. Hey guys, it's Mr. Andrew ESL. This is my Gary Talk number one. Why Gary Talk? Well, I was going to call it TED Talks, but apparently there's already a guy named Ted who talks. So I'm going with Gary. Gary's a fun name. Gary Talk number one will explain my philosophy for using authentic music in ESL teaching. So buckle up if you're driving while listening to this and aren't wearing a seatbelt. While we get ready to learn about authentic music in ESL teaching, the Mr. Andrew ESL way. So here's the problem. No one has ever asked if the songs we show our first and second grade students are any good. If they did, maybe it's just that they don't understand six to eight year olds. They offer these kids the same public domain songs year after year. Many of the kids will do the work because we're forcing them. But this is purely extrinsically motivated and you won't reach the portion of students who are reluctant to engage in learning. However, if you offer better songs and better music, you will intrinsically motivate them and reach a greater audience. But that requires better songs and better music. I started composing what I thought were better songs for ESL learning. They're not educational songs or children's songs. They're just songs. They're authentic. They can serve to teach the vocabulary, but they can also stand on their own. The students are happy that we're presenting them with new fun material, and all that strengthens the student-teacher bond. The fun thing about composing these kinds of songs is that anything can be a song. The parts of the body? That's a song. The weather? That's a song. Spaghetti squash? I guess that could be a song. Before you know it, it feels like we're at a concert. Students have no autonomy in life and they can't just go to a concert normally. But by offering them an enhanced experience like this, we're offering a little bit of that to them. We make it feel less like school, more like a show. And you look forward to a show. For some of them, it could be the best part of their week. It's much more dynamic than just watching a music video on your own at home. That's fun too, but in class, we're 20 people standing up and singing and dancing together. It changes the dynamic of the lesson completely. We shift our role from authoritarian to animator. We now get their collaboration, as when you go to a concert, you're more likely to participate willingly than you are to heckle the band. When we get their collaboration, we can then see intrinsic motivation. They have an interactive experience when they get up and sing and dance the songs with the class. We choose different students every song to dance and sing in front of the class and lead the song and demonstrate the dance. They also get to choose a friend to come up with them. They earn points for their participation. When they get to sing and dance in front of the class, they experience the feeling of competency and autonomy. And these are motivational factors. They're helping the whole class learn and practice the dance for the song. The dance helps with comprehension for the target vocabulary. That target vocabulary is often used in subsequent songs. Big, small, sun, rain, other frequently used cycle one vocabulary. And becomes a long-term investment. It is through learning in context that students effortlessly absorb the vocabulary. I've recently begun coding my songs to see how many times different target vocabulary is seen, sang, and danced in each song. For example, if we sing the rain or the sun, I will be able to tell you we practiced I 10 times, rain 6 times, etc. After a whole lesson, we could then say how many times we saw each targeted vocabulary word. The videos are pretty self-explanatory in terms of the comprehension dances. But if you want a slower step-by-step -step demonstration, you can check out my Mr. Andrew ESL reaction series where I break down each song step-by-step, dance-by-dance. I also like to add an element of gamification to authentic music. When we're singing and dancing in front of the class, our two dance leader students will get a point. 
if 76% of the class is singing and dancing, then everybody gets a point. I choose 76% because it's a ridiculous number that a grade one kid could never really calculate. So it gives us a chance to all count together and practice our numbers. Authentic music is also a good way to add differentiation to a lesson. If we're singing my song about shapes, I really only expect them to learn square, triangle, and rectangle, and practice the numbers that we use for each number of sides. Maybe learn the moon, heart, star, diamond. But there are other more complicated shapes in the song that stronger or even native speakers don't know yet. They can learn these new shapes as part of differentiated learning. In cycle one, even native speakers don't usually know the days of the week or the months of the year yet. We sometimes expect that they would, but in my experience, this isn't usually the case. My songs contain countless opportunities for new vocabulary, as there's more than just the lyrics to the targeted theme in the song. In recent years, education has seen a shift away from punishment for failure to collaborate to going towards the positive to encourage collaboration. But if we change the way that we teach, we need to change what we teach. We need to update the material. If you're still teaching eight-year-olds nursery rhymes that belong in daycare, you can't just take away the stick and expect a carrot to be enough. You have to give them something worth listening to. I often hear from other ESL teachers that they find cycle one to be the most emotionally draining. They find it very hard to get a whole class on the same page, singing and dancing the same song. But sometimes, the problem is that we're presenting them with public domain nursery rhymes that are better suited to a daycare center than a grade one or two classroom where the kids are sometimes eight years old. You can try to force them to sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat, but I don't think they're going to like it. At this point, the teacher has a few options. Some would write an agenda message. Some would call home. Some would talk to the homeroom teacher. Others the principal. Others would keep the kids in for detention. All of these options are emotionally draining and take a large amount of time. When in reality, you could have just presented them with better material. If we present them with better material, there's a better chance that they'll do the work without having to force them. In this age, we have to earn their attention. And if we don't present them with better material, we don't deserve it. Thanks for listening to my Gary Talk.